Sound check okay? Sounds good. Okay, excellent. <clears throat> Wait a couple more minutes. All right, looks like people are trickling in. Do you, um, are you ready to get started, Jim? Anytime. <clears throat> okay, great. So welcome everyone. Um, as always, uh, please remember our CGD code of conduct, be respectful and share the air during the discussion. So I'm very happy to introduce Dr. James Head as our seminar speaker today. Dr. Head is a distinguished professor in the Department of Earth, Environmental and Planetary Sciences at Brown University. He earned his bachelor's from Washington and Lee University in 1964 and received his PhD from Brown University in 1969. From 1968 to 1972, uh, while serving at NASA headquarters, he participated in planning for the Apollo program and received the NASA Medal for Exceptional Scientific Achievement and the Geological Society of America Special Commendation. From 1973 to 1974, he served as interim director of the Lunar Science Institute in Houston, Texas, and he joined the Brown faculty in 1973. Dr. Head's research centers on the study of geological processes that form and modify the surfaces, crusts, and lithospheres of planets, how these processes vary with time, and how such processes interact to produce the historical geological record preserved on the planets. Today, he will speak about the ancient climate of Mars. Was the ambient climate warm and wet or cold and icy? So take it away, Jim, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here. Um, and I really wanna um, uh, thank Zhang Zhu and, and others um, for this invitation. And uh, seven years ago, actually, Jennifer Kay had me uh, come out to Incar to give a talk on climate history of Mars essentially a, a geological perspective. Um, and clearly one of the things I wanna point out today is that uh, I am a geologist, okay, but climate models are one of the main tools we use to really understand the 
climate history of Mars. So in contrast to what I talked about, which is a broad brush view of climate history on Mars seven years ago, uh, hopefully you've had a significant evolution and turnover of staff and new people, et cetera. Um, today, I wanna to talk about the ancient climate of Mars was the ambient climate, warm and wet, or cold and icy. So just uh, a quick review here. I think um, one of the things that um, we really want to think major characteristics of the two planetary bodies. Um, and if you think about these, for example, um, you know, we can compare the Earth and Mars. And um, one of the things that, of course, <laughs> we know is that the Earth is not Mars. And let me just highlight some basic characteristic differences here uh, to emphasize this. So there's basically a series of things that are important to keep in mind here. Uh, Mars is smaller, about half the diameter. Uh, it's further away from the sun, obviously. Um, so therefore, the equilibrium temperature is a different, it's about 210 K, pretty cold, okay. The atmospheric composition is not nitrogen oxygen, it's CO2. Uh, mean surface pressure is not a bar, it's 6.1 millibars. And the obliquity uh, is actually very similar to that of the Earth at the present time, but we'll come back to this in a couple of minutes. Uh, the circulation pattern, basically a large Hadley cell is different than what we see on the Earth in detail. So. You know, you might paraphrase things by saying, okay, it's a combination of Monty Python and now for something completely different. And indeed the Wizard of Oz, uh, when Dorothy said, Toto, I have a feeling we're not in Kansas anymore. And indeed we're not in Kansas anymore, but there's some really fundamental, interesting comparisons between the two planetary body. While Earth is obviously not Mars, we have a lot to learn because the comparative planetology is really, really exciting and critical. So let's start with the Earth here briefly for comparison. There's active weathering, we know this, the hydrosphere, the atmosphere, et cetera, um, and also uh, plate tectonics, uh, constantly evolving topography on the Earth. Um, we see indeed significant oceanic buffering of the atmosphere and changes in the atmosphere. And of course we have atmosphere surface thermal coupling. On Mars on the other hand, um, we have ultra slow weathering. There is not an, a terribly intense hydrological cycle and system, and I'll go into that in some detail, um, there's only 10 to 20 precipital microns of water in the atmosphere. And uh, indeed, there are no plate tectonics, no evidence for plate tectonics. So there's intense, uh, long lasting topographic stability. So we do see topographic stability over 4 billion years or so. We don't see any oceans at the present time either. It's possible there may have been ones in the past and I'll touch on that as well. Um, and then the six millibar atmosphere is such that um, basically there is not atmosphere surface thermal coupling. And what happens is you see a latitude dependence of temperatures as opposed to um, essentially an altitude dependence of temperatures. On the other hand, we see evidence for variations in the climate in the history of Mars that are significant with potentially fluvial and lacustrine activity early on uh, in which there was a warm, potentially a warm wet early Mars. And we'll come back to that in a couple of minutes. So the beauty of this is that instead of, you know, a, a, only a portion of the climate record as we have on the earth, we have in fact four and a half billion years of geological history. And this is absolutely fantastic. I mean, like absolutely fantastic. So this has led geologists to divide the history of Mars up into three major eras, okay? Essentially the most recent one, the Amazonian lasting about 3 billion years um, from about roughly three to 3.7 billion years, the Hesperian period, and then from about uh, uh, 3.7 back into the formation of the planet, uh, the Noachian and pre-Noachian. And these have very different characteristics. Today, we see low impact rates. Uh, we see some volcanic activity, almost certainly continuing on till today. Um, but, but essentially Mars is, um, sorry, Mars is a, uh, essentially a, a cold and dry planet for the last 3 billion years. And I'll talk about that in a little more detail. As we go back in time, we see major changes. We see volcanic activity, 30% of the planet was resurfaced during this period. And there's evidence for huge amounts of water coming out from below the surface, groundwater, and flowing into the Northern Lowlands, perhaps creating oceans. Huge south circumpolar deposits, much larger than what we see today. Uh, and then we go back further, we have heavy impact bombardment, but we see these fouling networks and lots of other fluvial and lacustrine features and weathering features that suggest a warm and wet early Mars. So I wanna briefly talk briefly, very briefly about the Amazonian, the Hesperian, and then let's go into the Noachian to understand uh, whether Mars was warm and wet or in fact, cold and icy. 
The other aspect is we have the mineralogical history. This is incredibly exciting because the advent of spectrometers and um, uh, other orbital instruments and surface instruments has led us to understand the global characteristics of many of these. So in fact, we have in the Amazonian essentially anhydrous ferric oxides. It's an oxidizing environment. As we go back into the Hesperian, uh, we see sulfates and some unusual characteristics in here of layered sulfate deposits. But when we go back to the Nawakian, basically they're clays. This is known as basically a whole range of phyllosilicates indicating active weathering and uh, essentially alteration of uh, the surface rocks by water um, and almost certainly more clement type conditions, at least in terms of when those were and where those were altered. So this is really exciting again. And so our approach from a geological point of view has been um, to use as proxies the key geological elements to decipher the early climate history of Mars. We look at water as a proxy. What is its historical abundance? What is its state and what is its distribution? We look at alteration mineralogy as a proxy. What is its relationship to geological and climatic environments? And then we use the geological features, fluvial and lacustrine and degradation features. What is their relationships to evolving climate and the atmosphere, pressure, temperature, composition, behavior, and loss rates, for example. And what we try to do is to combine these together into three different approaches here, essentially. A geological process approach, which is the kinds of things we're talking about here. What is the water doing? What do the features look like? How do we interpret them? A stratigraphic approach. How has this changed with time? We start with the present and work our way back into the past to try to understand, indeed, um, when changes take place. When does the geology tell you that something radical has gone on in terms of the climate? And then when we find features, we collaborate with our climate modeling colleagues to understand what these variations are telling us. So we use and adopt a climate modeling approach to essentially make sense out of, um, out of the geological uh, process and stratigraphic approaches. So a couple of basic things to talk about here is themes throughout, throughout the talk today. Uh, the first is the nature of the hydrological system and the cycle on Mars. Uh, what we have here in the upper left is a cross section from the South Pole to the North Pole and a cross section through the upper uh, 10 to 15 kilometers of, of the crust. So basically today it is so cold, okay? It's cold at the surface, a cold hyper arid desert. Um, it, there's a low geothermal flux because Mars has lost heat as a function of time, obviously. And also there's a global cryosphere. The surface temperature is 210 K, um, uh, you know, in, in a mean annual temperature. Um, indeed, uh, everything up here in the upper few kilometers as shown here is frozen. Uh, and it probably contains water cement. It's probably uh, water and ice cemented. So it is indeed a global cryosphere. This is a horizontally stratified hydrological system. When you reach a depth where the uh, temperature at depth exceeds the melting point, then in fact, you're in a position where you can have uh, groundwater throughout this area here, the fractures and uh, pore space produced by impact cratering and other processes early on permit water to be in this, and uh, basically an aquifer in the subsurface. Um, on the other hand, as we go back in time, um, the geothermal flux is higher, okay? Uh, the atmospheric uh, geological characteristics, valley networks, uh, fluvial systems, lacustrine systems, et cetera, all suggest that in fact it's warmer and wetter and the prevailing hypothesis is that Mars is in fact characterized by a vertically integrated hydrological system that is to say much like we see on the earth we have rainfall we have infiltration uh, we have indeed um, the infiltration uh, uh, you know uh, the rainfall often exceeds the capacity of infiltration and so we get runoff fluvial networks, valleys, lakes, et cetera, things like that. So this is the perceived um, Nuwakian hydrological system. It's vertically integrated in contrast to today, horizontally stratified. So another key here is spin axis and orbital parameters. I mentioned to you that um, the current spin axis is approximately the same uh, on the Earth and Mars at the present time. On the other hand, Mars is known to um, have uh, significant variations in um, its uh, in, in its eccentricity, its orbital eccentricity, uh, and also in its obliquity. It's really um, sobering to realize how indeed the presence of the Earth's moon has influenced uh, the evolution of the Earth. When we take a look at Mars, it has a couple of space potatoes, Phobos and Deimos in orbit, 
and they really don't have much of an effect on altering or essentially altering the the um, the wobble and uh, essentially uh, obliquity of Mars. So um, indeed, uh, basically, you can think of Mars kind of like in the Southwest Airlines motto: "Well, we're you know you're free to roam." Well, it is free to roam. And Lascar, in a beautiful paper in 2004, outlined the characteristics of obliquity by solving a, you know numerically solving the solution of all the orbital interactions in the solar system and found that he could do a robust treatment of uh, the uh, solution for the last 20 million years of the history of Mars, but beyond that, the solutions are, are chaotic. Uh, nonetheless, he did a statistical analysis and found that obliquity on Mars could vary up to, you know, in excess of 60 to 70 degrees for periods of time during uh, the history of Mars. That's huge, okay, that's huge. And as we like to say in geology, if I can't recognize a climate signal like that, then you know I ought to go back to the drawing board or wherever geologists go. Um, and so the key here is that Lascar has, uh, we start with a robust prediction here, which is really kind of cool, okay. This is uh, today, this is obliquity, today and then back three million years. And if you take a look here, the obliquity is about the same as the Earth's. The Earth's um, obliquity is, in fact, this little fuzzy little line here over the last three million years. And Mars' obliquity is this line here. You can see that the mean obliquity is about the same, but the amplitude of the ob uh, obliquity has significantly changed, in particular between 0.5 and 2 million years ago, when it amped up to amplitude, when it, I'm sorry, when it increased up to about uh, almost 35 degrees in, in a couple of cases here. So again, this is really interesting and exciting. Um, and we also find that we have these Lascar et al. recent estimates, uh, predictions of astronomical climate forcing values, but we also have really good um, general circulation models, okay? They're not only uh, generally good GCMs, but they've also included now in the last decade um, a, a really robust hydrological cycle. So. We have all the authors, many of the authors of these here. Um, and bottom line is, uh, you know, significant amounts of polar water today, current polar water reservoirs represent most of the water, only 10 to 20 precipital microns in the atmosphere. Most of the water on Mars today is sequestered in the polar caps, a couple of kilometers high, hundreds of kilometers across. On the other hand, significant amount of polar water ice can be mobilized and transported equatorward during periods of higher obliquity. So if you increase obliquity, um, then in fact, you're pointing this towards the sun to put it bluntly or, or simply, over simply. And then that water vapor is, water ice is mobilized. It's, it migrates to uh, the coal traps, which are now becoming more like the, the equator. So we have some tools here, which you can use, um, conceptual tools, prediction tools, and also uh, climate modeling. So let's take a look at the last um, couple of um, uh, eras here, the Amazonian first. This is the last three billion years. Um, and in fact, the question is, what does the climate in the Amazonian look like? Well, we can start with Lascar's predictions um, and our strategy over the last, um, geez, it's probably been 15 or 20 years right now, um, has been to look at nonpolar, latitude dependent ice related deposits with the reasoning that if we take a look at the current polar caps, we increase the obliquities we saw here we look at the predictions of Lascar, the robust predictions over the last 20 million years, starting with these in the last couple of million years. And then we know the water cycle and CO2 cycle here from observations, current observations over the last 50 years, and we can then model it. So we go and we look for evidence of nonpolar latitude dependent ice deposits, and they're all over the place and they have different ages. So let's start with this most recent period here. And in fact, when we take a look at the details, we actually find um, in this period here, you can see very few craters on these deposits. Most of Mars has a thin tens of meters thick um, latitude dependent mantling deposit, which in fact we interpreted to be uh, related to these obliquity excursions here, which mobilized polar ice and then in fact deposited them in uh, lower equatorial rate towards the equator here. And this is a paper we published in 2003 uh, with, with indeed that, that hypothesis. And of course, as the amplitude of the obliquity decreased, this um, ice was uh, in fact ablated. Uh, it returned to the poles. Um, it created a sublimation till in fact left significant volumes of ice 
um, you know, meters thick at least uh, uh, deposits of ice uh, in these regions here, which we can actually see with landed spacecraft and also craters penetrating uh, into the subsurface. So let's keep thinking about this, okay? We, we actually explored mid-latitude, high-latitude, mid-latitude, a whole series of things, including tropical mountain glaciers, believe it or not. So here we are at the equator, that's right here. Okay, these yellow features are tropical mountain glaciers. Um, they're glacier deposits. Uh, they are no longer, they, they probably contain ice in the subsurface, but they no longer have ice on the surface and they're not moving. Um, but this one here at RC is 170,000 square kilometers. This is huge. So uh, 15 or so years ago, I went to Francois Forger and Bob Haberly, uh, two really um, well-known uh, climate scientists in our field. And I said, uh, Francois uh, and Bob, I've got, I've got tropical mountain glaciers. Geological features suggest tropical mountain glaciers. I remember Francois looking at these things, mon dieu, what are we gonna do? You know, it's like, Wow, okay, so we started exploring parameters, parameter space for climate models. Under what conditions would we get, in fact, tropical mountain glaciers? Well, we modeled this and in a paper in Science in 2007 showed that at 45 degrees obliquity, water ice is mobilized from the poles, moves down the side of the very high Tharsis region here, uh, goes up the side of Tharsis, adiabatically cools, and when it hits the sides of these volcanoes, it drops the water vapor out, creating, in fact, um, snow and ice deposits, which become tropical mountain glaciers. So we're able to actually use these deposits to fill in the obliquity history of, of Mars. And that's another whole story. But the bottom line is, for the Amazonian, for the last three billion years, the geological history shows an extremely cold and arid period with, in fact, a horizontally stratified hydrological system and essentially recycling from obliquity variations, um, water vapor and, and, and ice and CO2 uh, from the equatorial polar reservoirs into more um, equatorial region, I'm sorry, from the polar reservoirs to, into the more equatorial and mid-latitude regions. So that's essentially the signature of the Amazonian. It is completely consistent with anhydrospheric oxides in an oxidation state uh, uh, that we see today. Uh, for the last three billion years, actually, very much like Antarctica. So what about this middle period here, the Hesperian? This is really interesting because at this point, uh, as I said before, 30% of the surface of the planet was resurfaced with volcanic deposits, both explosive, but primarily effusive deposits. Uh, and then also there were these outflow channels that occurred. Um, so this is kind of a transition between here and maybe a warm and wet period here. This is also where a significant number of sulfates were deposited. So what, what's going on there, okay? Well, if we take a look here, the prevailing model is that indeed um, there was a global cryosphere at this time for, from a variety of different pieces of evidence. It probably was thinner because of moderate mean geothermal flux. Uh, we're getting back to over three and a half billion years ago, okay? And indeed, um, at this point, the construction of a lot of the large volcanoes around Tharsis propagated dikes out that cracked the cryosphere and released water, groundwater that was held under hydrostatic pressure um, in the subsurface. The increasing thickness of the uh, global cryosphere compressed the water is one idea that uh, combined with the dike emplacement events um, caused water to flow out onto the surface catastrophically and go down into the northern lowlands perhaps uh, indeed creating uh, uh, oceans. So these things are amazing, these outflow channels. I don't have, I, I could talk forever on these things because they're so interesting. You can see here at a scale of a couple hundred kilometers across here, these teardrop shaped islands, they're just absolutely amazing. Uh, massive amounts of water flooded out from the circumtharsis region around this area here and into the Northern lowlands. We have a lot of data that suggests that at the time, like deposits right at the origin of some of these uh, outflow channels, that the uh, climate was in fact cold and icy. We see glaciers around the areas of the effusion, uh, suggesting that the water vapor, the spray, et cetera, condensed and formed small glaciers here. Um, but nonetheless, water came out or came from somewhere uh, out and flooded down into the northern lowlands. There have been hypotheses for years about northern lowland oceans. Uh, but we've been unable to test them. People have mapped shorelines and other types of features that suggest that there might have been oceans uh, in the late in the late Hesperian, 
uh, in this uh, in in the northern lowlands here. <clears throat> and unfortunately, we weren't able to test that until the advent of Mars Global Surveyor, where we got global digital elevation data from uh, laser altimeter. And so we were able to test these models. We took the um, shorelines that are that were mapped and we compared them to um, essentially uh, equipotential surfaces from oceans. And they didn't match very well, actually. But you know, um, they really didn't match very well at all. There were two different kinds. One of them was not too bad, but the other one was all over the place. But but clearly vertical tectonics could have had a, a factor. So you know, people still argue about this today. Um, but there's a lot of evidence, I think, that has to be overcome to actually establish the presence of one of these oceans in the northern lowlands at this time. Uh, it would be the subject of another whole discussion. Quite, quite fascinating, I can add, but, but nonetheless. So what we've been doing is looking at, could the outflow channels themselves have an effect on the climate? Could it modify the climate from a cold and icy to a warm and wet, maybe for tens to hundreds of millions of years? So we've been modeling essentially the uh, emplacement of large bodies of water in the northern lowlands. Uh, it turns out that they freeze up and, and sublime away, go back to the polar cold traps pretty quickly. Um, we've also done climate models for these, and this is entirely too much wording here, so let me just point out the basics here. We addressed uh, Martin Turbet, Francois, Robin Wordsworth, and myself uh, analyzed the question, could late Hesperian catastrophic outflow channel warm water emplacement have modified the climate to produce rainfall in a cold contemporaneous climate. So we did model that, okay? And it turns out the conclusion is to jump to that, the event intensity is very high, okay? Because a lot of water comes out over a short period of time. That's this circle here, okay? Uh, this pink rectangle. Um, but indeed, the climate impact is very low. The bottom line is that precipitation really is only snowfall and it stops after a few tens of days whatever the atmospheric pressure, and we model a wide range of atmospheric pressure. So the individual outflow channels, and even collectively, they're probably not going to alter the atmosphere in the ways that have been proposed previously, which was to get uh, warm and wet conditions over tens to maybe even hundreds of millions of years. So another thing that's going on here is this huge amount of volcanic activity, okay? Punctuated volcanism. And again, the debate, as on the Earth, always comes back to what is the effect in the atmosphere? What goes on in terms of um, essentially aerosol and scattering and indeed the amount of time uh, that SO2 uh, might acu initially accumulate in, in the atmosphere could cause warming before, in fact, um, essentially uh, aerosol effects um, you know, kick in and, and you end up getting global cooling. So this is a question, this is a debate. We'll come back to this when we get to the Noachian. Um, uh, Itai Halibi and I took a look at this in 2012 and suggested that maybe we could get uh, uh, temperatures in the equatorial regions for a couple hundred years that might permit uh, rainfall, et cetera. Uh, uh, one of my ex-students, uh, Laura Kerber, and colleagues, we, you, she, she looked at the characteristics uh, of the uh, SO2 cooling um, in a really nice paper and, and showed that it probably uh, isn't the case, okay? So this is the debate we always have. Um, and I would say I agree with Laura's assessment. It's probably not a major effect, but it might be a local effect. And we're, we're working on that now. So what, what can we say about the Hesperian? Well, we have late Hesperian outflow channels. Was there a Hesperian ocean? There could have been, but it froze pretty fast and then uh, migrated to cold traps. What about the effect of the widespread volcanism? Um, this could be, in fact, um, a significant factor. Uh, but again, this question of how long and over what duration and what areas near the vents or global or latitudinal uh, might warming have taken place before cooling kicked in. Um, and then we have this uncomfortable record of the sulfates, these layered sulfates that are fairly widespread in the equatorial regions of, of Mars. And this is a, a topic of current discussion uh, right now. We're working very hard to look at the record of these sulfates and combine them with geological models for the ascent and eruption of magma and indeed try to figure out what they're telling us about both the atmospheric pressure at this time and also uh, the fate of uh, sulfur in the atmosphere in, in the context of sulfates and context of uh, sulfuric acid precipitation uh, and other factors, okay? So this is a big debate. It's not, well, just a subject of uh, investigation at the present time. But the hydrological cycle, most people would agree, is still horizontally stratified. 
So here we are then, um, indeed, in this transitional period here, looking back into the Noachian. We started here with an anchor in what we know today, working our way back. Something changed here, and now we're here, and we see lots of evidence for, indeed, valley networks, open and closed basin lakes, and we see evidence for hydrologically intense weathering of rocks to produce clays. So this is indeed um, something's different, really different going on here as we look back from the Hesperian into the Noachian. Uh, the consensus is that it's a warm and wet period. The evidence, the geological evidence strongly supports that. Um, and so that's where we are. That's the question at the present time. So we have indeed a summary of the hydrological system, horizontally stratified, thinner, but apparently still horizontally stratified. And the geological evidence is interpreted to mean vertically integrated back in the Noachian. So what is the evidence? What is the geological evidence for a warm and wet early Mars? <clears throat> this is really important because it's, it's there and it's all over the place. Well, not all over the place, but it's very widely distributed. So it comes in a few uh, forms. The first one is valley networks. This is a euphemism for fluvial activity, that is uh, precipitation, uh, runoff, um, exceeding infiltration, and formation of river and stream systems that are integrated, valley networks, that's what they're called here. Okay, so you can see them here on the edge of this uh, high. Uh, you can see them here coming down into this area here, and then we see channels leading out from this topographic low in purple here into this area and the surrounding area. There's no water in them today, but there are deposits that suggest that in fact, Many of these channels flow into um, uh, uh, craters and other depressions like this one. Here's a good example. This is the watershed for this crater here, Jezero Crater, where Mars 2020 uh, Perseverance rover is headed as we speak. And indeed, there are two channels leading into this and two delta-like features here. And we see about a 19,000 square kilometer um, uh, uh, watershed here and emptying into this uh, Jezero crater. And this is an open basin lake, which means water flows in and it flows out, it flowed out the other side. We see an exit channel over here, an outlet valley. So there's a couple of hundred of these open basin lakes shown here in these um, red circles. Um, and you can see here in blue, all these areas here, these are mapped valley networks. They're distributed in the Southern uplands along the margins of the Southern uplands. Uh, and uh, they're concentrated in a band uh, that's at an angle to the equator here. So we have valley networks, we have open basin lakes. We also have a couple of hundred closed basin lakes where water flows in and doesn't flow out. That's kind of the Hotel California of Mars lakes. Basically water checks in, but it doesn't fill up the thing far enough to actually get water to extend out the other side or the downward side, et cetera. So we can actually use that to test how much water might've been in there. A, a maximum estimate of the amount of water. The other thing we see is degraded craters. Um, this is also really critical. You can see that the craters in the Noachian differ significantly <clears throat> in terms of their preservation state from ones that formed over the last three billion years. And they, they, they have been measured and argued to be evidence for uh, an increase in degradation rates of erosion rates, a uh, significant increase in erosion rates uh, from the Amazonian and, and Hesperian back into the Noachian. <clears throat> Interestingly though, even though the rate has increased, the total rate is still below what we see in the very, very slow weathering rates we observe in the Antarctic Dry Valleys. But nonetheless, it's a fact, okay? So let me introduce this chart here to, to work us through the last um, period of time here thinking about was early Mars warm and wet or cold and icy? So this is very simply a, a paradigm chart, if you will, where we're looking at temperature in Kelvin along this axis, okay? Um, so 210 to 300, and we're looking at geological time here. This is the Noachian period leading into the Hesperian, early, middle, and late Noachian. It's about 400 million years long. <clears throat> and of course, we have up here at above 273K in pink, uh, essentially things that are above the melting point of water. And below this, in blue, we have things that are below uh, a mean annual temperature of 273K and thus <clears throat> cold and icy. So what do we have here for a frame of reference? Well, we have essentially melting point of water. We have the current earth mean annual temperature of about uh, 289K. 
we have uh, essentially the current Antarctic Dry Valley temperature. I've had I've spent five field seasons in the dry valleys of Antarctica. Believe me, it's cold. Fortunately, we go there in the summer where it's still below freezing, but occasionally uh, the beer, if you leave it in the sun, actually um, melts, liquefies, you know what I mean? So you can drink it, okay. So um, the bottom line here is that um, today, current Mars temperatures are 213, 210 to 213 K. So this is, this is a real difference here. So I'm gonna come back to this in a minute, but the geological perspective is very simple. Uh, we see evidence for um, uh, essentially valley networks, open basin lakes, increased uh, erosion rates, et cetera. And the geological model, Craddock, Howard, Irwin Moore, Andrews Hanna and others, very uh, excellent work on all of these, hypothesized that it's a warm and wet climate and the ambient climate was warm and wet, uh, maybe semi-arid to arid, depending on you know, what period of time in here. This was a sustained background ambient climate with the MAT range somewhere in excess of 273K. And they point out this is a terminal epoch here in which um, the erosion increased. Most of the valley networks and open closed basin lakes are in this period, whereas more, more of the slow erosion rates, et cetera, are back in here, where their hypothesis is that the precipitation rate, the rainfall precipitation rate was insufficient to exceed um, the infiltration rate. Um, and so therefore uh, it soaked in and um, did not uh, cause runoff of channels significantly, but that changed here uh, in a terminal epoch of intense fluvial activity. So this is a vertically integrated hydrological system. Over time, uh, at the end of the Noachian and into the Hesperian, it transitions to the cold and dry climate that we describe uh, typical of the Amazonian. Okay, so in 2013, um, a number of investigators uh, led by Francois Forget and Robin Wordsworth model the early Martian climate and a water cycle. And this was really important because this took, took advantage of uh, 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 essentially a lot of new data on uh, essentially surface pressures, cloud microphysics updated, uh, obliquity and orbital properties, atmospheric dust loading and model resolution. So this is a, re the Forger et al paper was really comprehensive. And then Robin added, uh, Robin Wordsworth, we added, uh, a, a, a water cycle to this whole thing uh, once the basic uh, model was developed. So the first thing that is clear is that for pressures more than a few tens of millibars, surface temperatures vary with altitude because of the adiabatic cooling effect, okay? So, you, you know, you, you get a, a sufficiently high atmospheric pressure so that you do have atmospheric surface thermal coupling and you get warming of the atmosphere as it moves vertically. And so you basically get the atmospheric cooling effect. But a second point is that no combination of parameters in the early, uh, assuming a faint young sun, um, no combination of parameters can lead to mean annual surface temperatures consistent with the melting and flow of liquid water anywhere on the planet. Wow, what a bummer, how can that be, okay? The next thing we did was to add a um, complete water cycle, which is what Robin did in his thesis. And it turned out that the addition of the water cycle um, adiabatic cooling effect causes the Southern Highland region temperatures to fall significantly below the global average and water ice is transported to the highlands from low lying regions and extended water ice cap forms on the Southern pole. And indeed, when we take a look at this, Mars looks something more like this, okay? So it's not a vertically integrated hydrological system, but it's a horizontally stratified one. Mean annual temperature is 225 K, okay? So it's a horizontally stratified hydrological system. In the, if you have a cross section from the South Polar region to the lowlands of the North Pole, any water, water vapor, snow and ice here will sublime in warmer temperatures, <laughs> warmer being a relative term, of course, um, at lower altitudes. And then this precipitates out of the highlands. This is the adiabatic cooling effect. And this led to the late Noachian icy highland scenario, basically, um, any water vapor in this scenario uh, in a water cycle ends up being snowed out in the southern uplands and basically stays there and so, until something comes along uh, to indeed melt it. Um, so the climate modeling perspective, going back to our diagram here, is very different, okay? So what do we have here? We have, in fact, uh, essentially a um, 225K mean annual temperature, cold and icy, sustained background climate, horizontally stratified hydrological system, and the adiabatic cooling effect suggests that the highlands, in fact, are mostly snow and ice. Um, so this is the work of 
uh, of a number of, of a broad group of people headed by Francois Forget and Robin Wordsworth and colleagues. So that's really amazing. Well, the geological perspective is, of course, totally different than that. Okay, uh, it's a horizontally, it's a vertically integrated hydrological system, and a lot's going on here. Well, you know, <laughs> this is really, really very different. And so the question is, you know, what do the geologists think about this climate model? Well, of course, you know, it's a model. We all know that. You all more than appreciate that, perhaps more than I do. Um, geologists would say that geological evidence is incontrovertible. It's just another climate model. They'll get it right someday. And, you know, that yeah, yeah, I understand that. I'm a geologist, okay. But at the same time, it's a really robust climate model. And um, again, there's lots to be, to be said here for, for the model. So what is the ambient Noachian climate? Was it warm and wet, like the geological data suggest? Or is it cold and icy, like the climate model suggests? How do we reconcile these two very different interpretations? And indeed, trust me, they are different, okay? Here is a portrayal of Mars um, in the warm and wet early Mars period with a five kilometer global equivalent layer of water, okay? Um, here is the cold and icy early Mars with 100 meters, hundreds of meters of water global equivalent layer and uh, proposed by these authors here uh, to testing it anyway. So these are very, very different. So the first thing you'd say is, well, all you need to do is get a little, um, uh, you know, pump up the greenhouse gases and, you know, it's, it's done. Okay, you get warm and wet early climate Mars and that's, that's all we need to know. But, you know, the key here is something that Robin, uh, that Francois pointed out in his 2013 paper. The key to success of greenhouse gases, their ability to absorb infrared radiation and their ability to sustain the needed concentrations. So in this diagram from a paper that Ashley um, Horan and I did a, a couple of years ago, we, we went through the major gases and talked about um, their effectiveness as well as where they come from. And the, the bottom line here is that, um, you know, it really, there aren't a lot of long-term sustaining greenhouse gases available to give you a 400 million year period of warm and wet early Mars. So, so this is a problem, it's a serious problem, okay? We're working on this now, um, hydrogen, um, uh, collision induced absorption, all sorts of things may alleviate some of this, but this is a huge, huge problem. So this led us to think about some other things. Do we require continuous warm and wet conditions? Maybe we don't have to have continuous warm and wet conditions. Maybe it's uh, episodic or periodic. So we took a look here in detail at this terminal epoch of intense fluvial activity. This is where we really see evidence for meltwater and runoff, uh, so precipitation and runoff. When we do this then, here's the Noachian, the 400 million years. And we plot here basically our estimates um, that for, for the total estimated range of time to carve the valley networks, not 400 million, less than 100 million years, and then various intermittencies, valley networks, fluvial analogs, um, continuous fan delta formation, a whole series of different estimates here. And from these, um, it's pretty clear that uh, requirements are a lot less than the total late Noachian. Not just the total Noachian, but the total late Noachian. So maybe we don't have to have continuous uh, types of activity. Maybe the climate does not need to be warm and wet for a very long period of time. So we started to explore these variabilities and these intermittencies. So if we take a look here, we all know what these are about, okay? Certainly the, the, the first here, I'm gonna come back to this chart from time to time. So episodic and periodic at a couple of scales, the normal atmospheric system variability, which we know really well, uh, the spin axis orbital variations uh, that force climate cycles that we've talked about with the work of Lascar uh, and others. So if we take a look at this then, um, we can investigate these things and think about a couple of uh, points here. The first one is that in terms of normal climate variability, mean annual temperature and peak annual temperature are not the same, okay? So we all know this, but you know, it's really hard sometimes you have to really sit down and think about this from a geological point of view. Here's the 225K mean annual temperature. Here is uh, models of the estimates of the variation in temperature at 225K over the course of a year. And you'll notice that peak temperatures can sometimes get to in peak summer, um, essentially above the melting point for just a few short periods of time here. Um, and so what we do is we take a look at this then, uh, we understand that MAT is not peak seasonal or peak daytime temperature, and we look at the annual temperature variation. 
here is the frequency distribution I was just talking about. If we lie it on its side, you can see here's the peak here, but the tails do go out. And even though they don't look important here, they do get above 273K for a short period of time. And sorry, and so, you know, could that do it? Could we just a few days a year, could that produce the features we see over millions of years? So this takes us to Antarctica. As I mentioned, we've had five field seasons in Antarctica and we're studying these phenomena in Antarctica. We have 253K mean annual temperature. And here's our field area in Antarctica. And you can see here, uh, this is a perspective view. That's me for scale here, okay? And you can see uh, indeed uh, the area here, a few hundreds of meters above, this, uh, above the valley floor. Uh, you can see snow uh, capping the upper parts of this here, also snow in the alcoves. You can also see relic channels and we can see fans, uh, these fans here. And we can also see uh, indeed uh, kind of wet deposits right down here in this area here. So if we take a look at this, the geological, uh, the structure is dry permafrost overlying ice cemented permafrost at about 15 to 20 uh, centimeters below the surface. And then groundwater, very similar to Mars. We have ice up here in the top. It's a horizontally stratified hydrological system. We get top-down melting up here in the top. The water flows off, flows along the surface, goes down to the top of the ice table, and indeed um, essentially freezes into the surrounding areas here. But it's sufficient at times to produce fluvial activity. So what I want to show you here is here's the mean annual temperature. Here's some of our data over the course of a year. In fact, there's quite a few days in here at peak southern summer in which the temperature can exceed 273K. Well, what happens when it does exceed 273K? Shown here is a uh, time-lapse photography uh, located, the, the cameras are located uh, about here and we're imaging the surface. Essentially, what you're gonna see is this video and you're gonna see seven days, okay, of activity um, throughout the day where seven, um, where one day equals seven seconds. So let's take a look at this and see how this works, okay? One day is seven seconds. So we're watching clouds, we're watching the drying peak daytime temperature, et cetera. Remember, it's always, what happens is during peak daytime temperature, uh, the ice in that upper part melts uh, the, uh, in the high altitudes. Uh, it flows down on the top of the ice table, flows across the surface, and then between um, those events, essentially, um, you can see here the dehydration wave coming across the surface here. And then of course, um, it comes down again. And after in the overnight, it freezes in the channel and then melts in the early morning. So what we're seeing here is indeed seven days, okay? One day equals seven seconds. And we're seeing significant geomorphic work being done here. If you multiply this, now watch this last one here where actually you see some lateral erosion through this fan. So indeed we can conclude from this that in fact, uh, you can get significant erosion here. Um, this may not look significant, but multiply it by, uh, in fact, uh, hundreds of thousands to millions of years. Um, so we asked the question, can peak annual temperatures at 225K explain the valley networks? We go back to our climate models. We, we model the sequence here. We find that in fact, 16 and percent of Mars in these peak times uh, during the year, uh, in fact, uh, exceed the melting temperature um, at some point in the, uh, the, the, the year during the 225K mean annual temperature. The problem is though that in fact, all of these are in the lowlands, not where the snow and ice is, and not where the valley networks are rather. And you can see here, these areas here representing uh, where uh, melting might take place and they don't represent a very significant amount of the surface uh, area. So, okay, well, Probably a phenomenon, but not the one that's going to explain everything for us here. So let's take a look indeed. What happens if we just elevate the temperature like 18K, for example? Let's see what happens then. Uh, maybe you get greenhouse gases for thousands of years or maybe a million years or whatever. Modest elevation of the baseline MAT by 18K, going back to our diagram, the idea here would be that you would have enough seasonal melting to cause annual snowmelt runoff and valley networks. So this is a possibility. We've looked into this. Modest amounts of greenhouse gases might provide such a phenomenon. Well, are there other options? Well, indeed there are, okay. If we take a look at punctuated activity, we have <laughs> internal and external uh, types of uh, processes here. External stochastic variability. This would be impact cratering, okay. These are episodic, they're punctuated. Um, they vary in magnitude. 
uh, and they can produce significant atmospheric effects uh, on the scale of uh, uh, hundreds of thousands of years. We'll also take a look at volcanic activity. So the idea here is that we get punctuated events that for shorter periods of time might raise uh, the mean annual temperature above 273K sufficiently long to produce the geomorphic features that we see, maybe repetitively because both volcanic activity and impacts are repetitive. So impact punctuated events are really <laughs> significantly important. It can heat the atmosphere up to 1000 Kelvin. You get, in fact, <laughs> you get silicate precipitation. You get silicate uh, vaporization and precipitation. Uh, you get global hot rainfall in the aftermath. And this can cause global erosion events that can last for hundreds of years. Uh, Ashley Palumbo and I um, uh, and uh, Martin Turbay and, and us, a group of us, uh, model these. And you can, you can see here from the event to hundreds of years, you get silicate vapor plume formation, expansion cooling, vapor condensation, water vapor condensation, global rainfall, and an intense hydrological cycle. So, man, this is really important and potentially really um, uh, significant. Um, in fact, we've modeled this and we think that at the Jezero landing site for Perseverance um, uh, on the way to Mars, some of these deposits here could possibly be related to this type of activity early in Martian history. And we have a plan to do sampling uh, that will assess that. So punctuated events drive uh, temperatures through the ceiling, so to speak. But the problem is when we model these out um, in the Turbay et al. paper, we find that in fact, only really big basins that occur way back in the early Noachian are likely to be the case. And most of the valley networks and things are here. So major basins are probably not the key factor. So what about explosive volcanic activity? Could this be the case? Punctuated volcanic event might do the same sort of thing. Um, but again, we have this problem, okay, of global warming versus global cooling, one which we're intensely working on at the present time, uh, doing modeling and geological observations. Um, so the bottom line here is we have impact basin scale induced variations and we have volcanism induced. These, you know, we're still debating this. The big basins are early on, but it may be that some of the smaller craters and basins, as Bob Haverly has pointed out, uh, could produce sufficient H2 to uh, essentially warm the climate for a period of time. And with collision induced absorption, as we have published in a GRL paper here, combining these together might actually provide a mechanism. So we're investigating that right now. With the volcanism, probably not global based on Laura's work, uh, but it could have, let melting, could have led to melting of snow and ice and runoff. And we're looking at these and comparing them to what we see in the geological record to test this hypothesis further. So we've also taken a look at the nature and distribution of precipitation in an above freezing um, climate. Okay, so uh, Ashley and I modeled um, in a GRL paper in 2018. So what would um, the climate look like in like a 275 degree, 275 Kelvin mean annual temperature climate? It turns out that snowfall is still dominant. Rainfall is negligible. We model that you need to get it above 285, 289K. Um, on Mars to actually get significant rainfall. Uh, fluidal activity is dominated by snow accumulation and melting. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's another data point here. It, it looks like even at 275, uh, you're not gonna get significant precipitation, uh, uh, essentially pluvial, that is rainfall precipitation and runoff. So let's ask the question. Uh, let's go back to the distribution of snow melt and comparisons with the distribution of valley network lakes uh, in an above freezing climate, global MAT uh, of 275K. So let's think about this. What is the distribution of valley lakes, valley networks and lakes? Um, is it correlated with the cold and icy or the warm and wet? So if we think about this, here's the thing we're trying to do here is, okay, if the adiabatic cooling effect is real uh, and we have an equilibrium line altitude here, where a perspective view from space down to this point here would look something like this, Here's craters in the lowlands, here's the highlands, it's ice covered. If we were able to um, find a mechanism to increase in a cold and icy environment, the mean annual temperature, just a few degrees Kelvin for a significant period of time, then we would push that um, equilibrium line altitude up into um, the uh, snow and ice causing melting and runoff, potentially significant amounts of runoff and producing these features here. Uh, that is to say valley networks potentially and open and closed basin lakes. Well, is this plausible? Let's take a look. How does the distribution of 
these features relate to this model of the equilibrium line altitude at plus one kilometers. This would be all snow and ice. This is all dry down here in the lowlands. And indeed, this is the late Noachian icy highlands model. What happens if we uh, produce significant elevation, uh, minor elevations of temperatures uh, to cause the geotherm to go, uh, sorry, the zero, sorry, to the equilibrium line altitude to move up into uh, this deposit? Well, first we have the area itself, and then we have the distribution of valley networks. This is all these blue things here are valley networks that are plotted on top of the equilibrium line altitude at plus one kilometers. If we take a look here, um, then we ask the question, you know, it's a pretty good correlation. They all occur either at the margins or within and around the margins here in the Hellas Basin. If we take a look at open basin lakes, which are lakes where water flows in, flows out again, they tend to be concentrated around the margins and also within uh, and at the edges of the um, uh, icy highland model. And if we look at closed basin lakes, they obey a similar type of relationship here. And when we put these all together, I think the combined aspects really suggest um, that this is a hypothesis worthy of further investigation because there's a very high correlation. This is all visual. I can show it uh, statistically as well in terms of altitude distribution, et cetera. Uh, but this gives you the picture of what we think is going on. And does top-down melting produce a lot of water? <laughs> you better believe it. This is. Uh, in uh, Antarctica, okay, just on a warm day where ice is flowing off the top of the ice sheet from top down melting, it's still a coal based glacier. And we've calculated that 2000 year climate excursion at plus 18K could give you the same amount of water that's seen in all the open basin and closed basin lakes. And again, a, a single summer at MAT of 273K could provide a significant amount of that as well. So this we think is a viable model. We have three models for um, uh, options other than warm and wet continuous ambient climate, the Antarctic Dry Valley mode where MAT is below 273K, but peak annual and seasonal temperature might exceed that. We have punctuated impact events, which may also have an effect and punctuated volcanic events, which, which could also contribute. So lurching towards conclusion here, um, we see the, again, our conclusion really is that sustained Noachian warm and wet climate conditions they're not required to explain what we think the valley network, open basin lakes and closed basin lakes and crater degradation uh, characteristics are. Transient punctuated melting of icy highlands seems plausible, but we need to do more testing and we're in the process of doing that now. So what's the, the Noachian climate solution? <clears throat> well, much more discussion and exploration of parameter space is required. And that's where I really, at the end, I'll have my, <laughs> my uh, uh, email address and I really, you know, let's be clear here. We need all the help we can get on this. And I encourage you to send me an email if you see something you think you uh, might be useful or you'd like to collaborate on or some insights, et cetera, uh, or have students that would like to work on some of these aspects. I'd be happy, happy uh, to talk to you and help out. It's really important. Not only that, we have a lot of new data coming in in the very near future here. Uh, in fact, uh, we have a series of uh, uh, spacecraft that are in operation uh, at Gale Crater uh, and uh, the previous Pathfinder, et cetera. And on the way to Mars are two spacecraft the, um, the, uh, from NASA, okay, that's going to Jezero Crater and Open Basin Lake. And indeed, um, uh, from Chensa, the Chinese uh, National Space Agency, uh, a rover that's going into this area here, which is thought to be an ancient ocean. And then in the following uh, two years, uh, European Space Agency will send another one to uh, these kinds of lake deposits here uh, in um, the region around the Viking and Pathfinder region. So we have a lot of data coming in, a lot of questions, and we'll ultimately have more sample return uh, from uh, certainly the Jezero Crater area uh, before the end of the decade uh, to address many of these questions. So thank you very much, um, and I'm totally happy to answer any possible questions here. Uh, thank you. Thanks very much, Jim. That was a great talk, covered a lot of ground, a lot of interesting uh, research that you've covered here. Um, so if you have questions for Jim, you can type them in the chat box and I'll read them aloud, or you can use the raise your hand feature in the participants window and uh, unmute yourself and ask your question. And, and I would just add too that if you, you know, I mean, I, I realize four and a half billion years of history in 55 minutes is not easy. Um, I, I'm happy to answer any questions, check out my email and, um, 
you know, you, you can please, please let me know if, if we don't have time here. I'm happy to stay on as long as people want to talk. Great, thank you. Questions for Jim? Peter. Uh, so is it correct that the transitions between these different epochs depend upon the amount of heat coming upwards from the core? And if so, how do you estimate that over so many billion years? Yeah, so it's it, basically the bottom line there is that <clears throat> uh, it is internal heat. Um, you start with models for the <clears throat> formation of, of Mars, um, you know, theoretical models for accretion and heat loss early on, magma ocean, et cetera, et cetera. And then it's basically because it has no plate tectonics, it's largely lithospheric conduction almost wholly lithospheric conduction. Even the volcanism, the advective cooling is pretty, pretty minimal over geological time. How do we actually establish those values? What we do is we look at flexural history. So we can look at the North Polar Cap, which is relatively recent, and see if there are flexural moats around it. And we can back out the geothermal gradient. We can look at ancient volcanoes, see if there's any moats around these, what their magnitude is, and we can back out a geothermal gradient from that. So there are indeed a few uh, I would say plausible and, and robust data points there. Uh, but again, this is something that um, we're trying to do right now on Mars with the InSight mission is to try to measure um, heat flux and uh, level of activity at the present time. So it's an ongoing question, but, but there's a fairly robust, um, um, you know, essentially model for the loss of heat as a function of time. Joe has a question. Yeah, thanks for a really nice, uh, presentation. I really enjoyed it. Um, it I, I wanted to ask about the time scales uh, required for uh, valley networks versus the time scales required for lake formations, which might take longer, it seems to me, and might not be susceptible to formation it, during transient events. Yes, that's a really, that's a, a question we've been struggling with for a while. And, you know, the, the bottom line is, I think that we can, um, we, w people have modeled the formation of the deltas. How long will it take under various conditions to form these deltas? Okay, with continuous flow, with discontinuous flow. And these, these are pretty, pretty short, thousands of years, um, tens of thousands of years, not millions of years, not tens to hundreds of millions of years. Um, you know, we've done some calculations on uh, top-down heating and melting. Um, we see this in Antarctica. We can take a look at the rates there. It's, it's quite striking. You know, in Antarctica, we have transient rivers, the Onyx River, uh, transient streams. Um, and I showed very um, uh, punctuated kind of like runoff in my video of our uh, field site. But, but, you know, in other places, it's continuous throughout the southern summer, um, uh, because the because of the geometry of the illumination and, and heating of the glaciers, etc. Um, so, so, so we're trying to in places like Jezero, we can isolate the um, drainage basin, um, and also then try to do calculations on precipitation rates, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, to balance out, <clears throat> you know, the time to carve the valley networks and as well as to fill the basins and have them overflow. Mm -hmm. So they're they're all tending towards, for individual things, relatively short periods of time. Um, and even in the, the most uh, vehement proponents of the warm and wet uh, ambient climate, you know, still absolutely agree that it was at the end of the Noachian where this climate, so-called climate optimum occurred. And that's, that's where most of the fluvial activity actually took place. Um, so yeah, we're still on the case, but you know, I think it's, it to me is really um, focusing on uh, short, per, shorter periods of time rather than longer. The, I, I, would, I would say one other point here that I didn't have time to go into, the phyllosilicates, the clays, they are not associated with the valley networks of the open and closed basin lakes. They're completely, almost completely independent of the occurrence of these things. And that's led people to think that they actually may have been altered in the subsurface and brought to the surface by impact cratering ejecta. Uh, so even one of the main pieces of evidence for a warm and wet early Mars, um, you know, is not directly correlated with the fluvial and lacustrine events, the major 
characteristics of wet Mars that we see. So that's another conundrum, if you will. It may be that they're not related. We don't see evidence for evaporite. So we don't think um, that there's a lot of evidence for, you know, sustained, um, uh, you know, wetting and drying and wetting and drying in these, in these open basin and closed basin lakes. Okay, thank you. Question from Panetta, go ahead. Yeah, it's just a absolutely fascinating talk. Um, what uh, you mentioned in a number of the simulations, uh, you're considering a range of surface pressures. What's the, is there a received picture of the evolution of the surface pressure on geological time scales? Uh, it's, it's very much model dependent at the present time. <clears throat> and this is something we're working on really intensely. Um, I'm writing a review paper for Icarus at the moment on, on, on this theme. Um, and basically we have the primary atmosphere, which is the accretionary atmosphere. Um, these big basins can actually blow that off. <laughs> you can imagine that, oops, it's gone. You know what I mean? Um, and, and then we have a secondary atmosphere, which is derived from continued impacts, but also primarily from degassing of the interior. Um, the, the assumption is that the Nowakian climate was a bar. You know, I always, it's so, you know, you know human nature, okay? Um, yeah. Well, oh, what, what, what cool could it be? Oh, it's probably a bar like the earth, you know? Well, maybe not, you know what I mean? Um, it's, it's sort of like we're unique in the cosmos here uh, because we're here, you know? And it, 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 terra centrism um, is really a danger, okay? So anyway, um, what we have now is um, I think uh, clearly more robust models and we're getting them. We have a spacecraft in orbit. Um, uh, Bruce Tchaikovsky is, uh, um, over, over at CU is, is the PI of, of this. Uh, and this mission um, is really important because it provides evidence for the loss rates at the present of, uh, of uh, atmospheric species. And so uh, Bruce's work with the MAVEN mission is really helpful in trying to isolate as they're getting more data with time, isolate what those loss rates might've been and what that means for the early climate. My suspicion is that the secondary atmosphere is likely to have been probably no more than a few hundred millibars, not a bar. And one of the things I'm working on right now is the decrease in atmospheric density as a function of time and how that affects volcanic activity and volcanic outgassing. I, my suspicion right now, we published a couple of abstracts on this, is that the decrease in atmospheric pressure, not from a bar, but from a few hundred millibars to tens of millibars is having an effect on the outgassing of, of sulfur and sulfur species. And that could be part of an explanation for the transition uh, to these sulfates we see. So uh, that could be a really great proxy and we're working on that right now. But I, I would say <laughs> less than a bar, you know, we modeled up to seven bars for crying out loud. Uh, yeah. But, but uh, yeah, I would say less than a bar, probably of the order of a couple hundred millibars um, uh, for the Noachian climate. Okay, I think we'll take this last question from the chat from Philip Judge. I saw a reference to the faint young sun paradox. Is there new information in your studies that influences this paradox? Um, not, not really. I, I would just say, um, you know, this is of course one of my recurring nightmares here. You know, I, I, I don't feel I have an investment in the outcome of was Mars warm and wet or cold and icy in an ambient climate. I'm just trying to test the hypotheses. But occasionally I wake up in the middle of the night thinking, you know, Jim gets the news. It wasn't, you know, there, the sun is a variable star. By the way, you know, here's a mechanism that can, um, you know, uh, far UV, a whole sorts of things that, that might actually produce a, a, a hundred million years or 10 million years or a few million years of uh, climate conditions on Mars. Entirely possible. And this is the argument, of course, we have on the earth all the time. What, what was it like? Okay, what was it like? So these are really a couple questions. Um, and so we're looking closely, more closely to the terrestrial community and the solar um, evolution modeling community uh, to really give us insight into this. So that is an assumption. It's about 70, 75% of its um, current luminosity at this point based on the models and, and our models are based on that. Uh, so that, that's, that's, a, that's a variable potentially. And, um, you know, uh, my, my nightmare could be actually, uh, could come true. And it wouldn't be a nightmare. It would be, wow, we really learned something about the variability and maybe solve some problems. So anybody has any news on any uh, forefront research there? I really would hope you'll be, put me on the distribution list for that one. 
All right. Well, thanks very much, Jim, for a great talk. Uh, thanks, everyone, for the questions. I think we'll close it out. And